give you a brief. Can I give you a go on step 502 by the clock? Copy. No, it's not your small. He's got me just facing back twice, so I take good care of that. And we are at two minutes, nine minutes, and counting in a series of missions to the nearest space station. And we will leave Andy Thomas aboard here. He will be the seventh and final U.S. astronaut to call the station home. All personnel, the countdown clock will begin in three minutes. Launch status check. Verify ready, resume count. Go for launch. Say go or no go. OTC. OTC go. TBC. TBC go. TPC. TPC go. LPS. LPS go. Houston flight. Flight go. Hey, Terry, looks like uh, weather's good. Uh, looks like we got a good vehicle, and we're going to try to get you out of town tonight, and uh, be looking forward to seeing you back here in uh, nine or ten days. Thanks a million. We'll see you in a few days. Flight crew, O2C, close and lock divisors, and initiate O2 flow. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Endeavor's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. 15. T minus 13 seconds. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, we have a go, we have to start, four, three, two, As the Space Shuttle Endeavour blasts off to the heavens, on board are seven remarkable people. Six NASA astronauts and one Russian cosmonaut are all members of an elite few, those who are chosen to break the bonds of Earth's gravity. Endeavour's travelling at the speed of about 2,000 miles per hour. Two minutes, nine seconds into the flight, the booster officer confirms good separation of the solid rocket boosters. One of the astronauts is Dr. Andy Thomas, a space engineer born in Australia. He was selected by NASA in 1992. But Thomas began his journey to join Mir 12 months earlier in Moscow. He began training at the Russian Space Agency's Star City Complex. For Thomas to become NASA's last astronaut to join the troubled Mir, he must graduate as a fully-fledged cosmonaut. Some people thought that I was crazy. Um, they would say to me, you know, you're going to have to go and live in Russia, endure the winters, and you're going to have to learn Russian. And my reaction was, well, that's why I want to do it. For four and a half months, home for Andy Thomas will be a place where night turns into day every 90 minutes. A non-dimensional world, no up, no down. Gravity is ineffective here. All astronauts must adapt to the weightlessness. It rules their every move. Although Thomas has been to space once before, as part of his cosmonaut training, he must make a journey on what is known as the Vomit Comet, 
It's a Russian transport plane that defies gravity by repeatedly climbing, then dropping into freefall. That was a lot of fun. What we were doing there was practicing donning and doffing the suit in zero gravity, doing it yourself, just so you get a sense of how you can get into the suit in zero gravity. It's actually easier to do that in zero gravity than in uh, 1G. Also uh, handling large masses in zero gravity, where something may be weightless but it has a lot of mass and therefore a lot of inertia and you have to handle things carefully or it can upset your own uh, balance. When you see the changes is when you come back to Earth and then we really notice uh, difficulties with keeping your blood pressure up. Uh, you notice it with a neurologic function and reflexes. Uh, you notice it with uh, bone density mass for the long duration flyers and that sort of thing. Intense medical scrutiny is vital. To perform well, it's critical that the body's cardiovascular system copes with the stresses of life without gravity. When you stand up in normal gravity, you know, most of your blood volume is contained in your in the venous system of your lower extremities. Well, in zero gravity or microgravity, there's none of that. Your blood volume redistributes to the, to the torso. So what that test does, it applies a negative pressure to the lower extremities and torso and pulls the blood down towards the feet. This same test will be applied to Thomas in orbit on Mir to make sure his fitness in space matches his condition here on Earth. Take me out. <laughs> Take me out, please. <laughs> you don't actually have to be as fit as you might think. You know, you don't need to be an Olympic athlete. Um, and you don't need to be, uh, you know, an Arnold Schwarzenegger or something. In fact, you wouldn't want to be. That would be bad in a space, in a confined small spacecraft. Um, you just you have to be reasonably healthy, I think that's that's all. Thomas makes time each day for at least an hour's exercise. These are hallowed surroundings. The world's first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, also trained here in this Star City gym forty years ago. A typical day involves eight hours of training, either in the classroom or in a mock-up of the Mir space station. At the end of it, he returns to his accommodation, but there's no time to relax. It's been a lot of work because it's all been in Russian, so there's a huge overhead of labor involved in uh, reading the technical manuals, for example, understanding uh, the words that they use and understanding the concepts. Right now, I'm pretty tired. The pressure is beginning to tell. Thomas faces his final exams. I'm actually tempted to say, look, this is too much for one week. I've, I've kind of, in a way, I've let them overextend me for this week. There's no doubt about it. Too much, uh, too much exams. We'll see. Andy Thomas and the three-man crew that will join him in space have an eight-hour test mission ahead of them in the Mir mock-up. It's really a pre-flight qualification exam for the crew uh, to ensure that they're familiar with basic procedures, they're able to work together well and deal with problems that come up. And they have a lot of specialists from uh, the supporting organizations here to uh, make an evaluation. The crew will simulate a full day's orbit aboard Mir, activating systems, conducting experiments, and checking and maintaining equipment. Well, 
The examiners check their every move on closed circuit TV. It's pretty detailed. They want to see that you understand the system, how it works, what it does, and why it's there, and how to operate it. So there's quite a deep level of detail in it. As Thomas activates Mir's monitors, his commander, Colonel Talgut Mushbea, checks that he's following the correct procedures. Mushbea is a former fighter pilot and knows Mir backwards. He lived aboard it for four months in 1994. Flight engineer Nikolai Budarin is also a Mir veteran. He was a crew member for the first docking mission with NASA's shuttle in 1995. The fourth crew member is a Frenchman, Leopold Erhartz, who's on his first mission into space. Andy Thomas will be the first of this team to board the space station when the shuttle Endeavour takes him to dock with Mir. His colleagues, using a Russian spacecraft, will rendezvous with him a week later. In their training, it's essential that the crew know not only how to operate the space station, but also how to cope if things go wrong. Yeah, we're going to check the procedures that you use in the event of a fire or a depressurization of the station, which requires that we go around and check the position of various uh, valves on the hatches and uh, pieces of equipment to make sure that things are ready in the event that we have to do an emergency exit. We can just grab everything and go. If that happens, the crew's salvation will be this tiny capsule, the Soyuz. Just three meters wide and seven meters long, the Soyuz is permanently attached to the side of Mir in case of an emergency. Lying on their backs, it would take the cosmonauts less than a day to make it home to Earth, 385 kilometers below. In this test, the crew simulates an emergency descent in this situation, the Soyuz would shed its instrument and orbit modules and punch through the atmosphere, then parachute either into the sea or onto land. To prepare for such a drama, this Mir crew underwent survival training where they were dropped into the sub-zero Black Sea in a Soyuz capsule. I didn't know what to expect uh, because, you know, I just thought, well, the soy is small, maybe this is going to be claustrophobic, underwater, you know, it's a bit disturbing to look out the window and see fish. <laughs> it's not what you expect in a spacecraft. It was a tough exercise. We were actually in the capsule bobbing around in the water for two hours just to change our clothes before we could get out. It was hard work, very hard work. Lost a kilogram and a half of water in the process. Just sweat. <laughs> This Sunday, take Today's the day Andy has been striving towards for 12 months. The moment he officially becomes a Russian space agency cosmonaut. This is the last time a NASA astronaut will receive this honor and join Mir before the agency turns its attention toward building a new international space station. For me, it was about 14 months of training, squeezed into 12 months to, uh, to get to this point. And a lot of energy, too, I might add. So it's very gratifying to uh, have this closure. Now a fully-fledged cosmonaut, Andy Thomas flies back to America as Endeavour, which will deliver him to Mir, is rolled out at the Kennedy Space Center. At 
55 meters tall and 2 million kilograms, Endeavour will be making its perilous docking with Mir for the first time. After all the near disasters on Mir, media interest in the mission is high. In America's Congress, questions are even raised over whether the Thomas mission should proceed at all. Well, we're going to have to talk along, right? Uh, we're the Shuttle Mir docking flight number eight. And with that, I'll turn this over to you guys for questions. The making of an astronaut takes years of training and focus. NASA interviews thousands of hopefuls each year, but only a handful succeed. Just why are some selected over others? What does it take to be made of the right stuff? I don't know. <laughs> um. When I sat with all the folks in the interview group that I was in, uh, I wouldn't have picked myself. I would have picked a lot of other people over me. And how they picked me is a dark secret, but I'm glad they did. Jim Riley is a mission specialist on Endeavour. With a PhD in geology, he is responsible for operating the shuttle's onboard systems and scientific payload operation. Michael Anderson has never been to space before. He's a pilot with a physics degree and knows what NASA is looking for when selecting astronauts. Men and women with a multitude of varied skills. First of all, you need to have a good solid technical background, you know, that, so you're prepared to handle the uh, challenges that are going to be thrown at you. But I think also you have to be a very flexible person. You have to be a person who can uh, take changes rapidly and adapt to those changes. Then you also need to be a person who can work well with other people. You know, we take a crew of seven or eight people and we put them inside this very small space shuttle and we put them up there on orbit for up to 20 days. And those people need to be able to work together during that time and to get along well. After surviving the nerve-wracking final selection process at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, successful candidates are thrown into intensive training. In our case, it was about 14 months long, and it was basically everything you need to know to operate the shuttle as a vehicle, and it covered everything. Well, Kenneth has the latest and greatest, and he has a couple items he'd like to talk about. It's one thing to train as an astronaut, it's quite another to be assigned to a mission. And the crew of Endeavour is now on a daily regime of launch and landing simulations, emergency evacuation exercises, and detailing life aboard the shuttle. This is the shuttle motion simulator. It tests their capacity to cope with crisis after crisis fed to them by instructors. Malfunction scenarios bombard them as they practice takeoffs and landings up to a thousand times each. But Andy Thomas has one last hurdle to cross. All mission specialists have to be able to function as a flight engineer on a T-38 jet but it's been a year and a half since Thomas has been near one. It's busy. It's not something I've ever been accustomed to do. I'm, I never had the formal training that some of the military pilots have. And so you have to learn to think in a very dynamic situation. It's not easy to do. I think it's going to be fun. I'm, this is probably the most fun I've had in 18 months. <laughs> Flying in these aircraft is considered essentially as part of your crew training to be able to interact with a, a front seat pilot and uh, work the controls and avionics systems. Call for taxi. Okay, uh, we'll use 140 as our going to go to the major day. Okay, I'll have the 9-2 ready to take off. 3-5.
Jet control systems malfunction. Seems like this is. Yeah, I think the steering is screwed up. It's gonna. Sounds like it's tightening or something. Mm -hmm. Seems like there's something wrong with it. Yeah, we got. Uh, what if there's some other problem? Just look at our balance. If you'll balance. That's nice. It's two minus two two. You know, I think we want to get on the ground. Your wheels are down, and we're clear to land, thanks. Okay, we're back home. First ride in a C-38 in a year and a half. It was not easy. It was a good experience. Well, the T-38 was not agreeing with it, that's for sure. Yeah. Let's go for auto sequence start. And the handoff has occurred. This is a high-risk, high-cost calling. Just months before Thomas's mission to Mir, a drama unfolded that reminded every astronaut of just how dangerous such missions can be. Two, one, and liftoff! Columbia with the Microgravity Science Laboratory. Here at NASA's Marshall Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, Control room staff were, as ever, unaware of what lay ahead of the shuttle Columbia as it blasted off for a 16-day scientific mission. Columbia's three-minute engines have now throttled back to two-thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft to pass through the area of maximum air pressure and go supersonic. Columbia is traveling 650 miles per hour. Yeah, Space Lab wants to go for Janus. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, now that you've removed the access panel, we'd like to see if you could verify the integrity of that cable. The Roger came over to help me because I'm not real happy with what's going on. As here. Janet Voss, the payload commander, began activating the science experiments, her commander, Jim Halsell, received disturbing news from Mission Control. My first knowledge that we had a problem which might impact the mission was from an electronic mail that I got from my boss. He said, hey, we're seeing a problem that inside the fuel cell, we are receiving instrumentation readings indicating that you might be in danger of having the fuel cell uh, catch on fire or even explode. For Susan Still, the pilot, the excitement of being on her first shuttle flight was soon replaced by a new reality, a real crisis in space. And I saw you copy 511. The fire would be uncontained and in a place where we can't put it out. So that would definitely be a catastrophic problem. Columbia Houston for Jim. We've made the decision down here to go ahead and safe fuel cell two. First, uh, however, we have a number of power down steps that are, will involve both orbiter and payload equipment for you to perform. Two and one are now off. The fuel cell was shut down, and almost all the lights on board were switched off to save power. The fire risk was gone, but the crew wasn't out of danger yet. We can fly okay on two fuel cells, but it's the policy of our program to allow for a next failure. 
And if we were to have another fuel cell failure, then we would um, we have difficulties coming back. 322, 23, 35. Columbia, Houston, Simo on air to ground one and two when you're ready. We're ready. Roger, Jim, the uh, MMT had uh, all players in on the meeting uh, right through from the factory, and the consensus is it will uh, shorten the mission. When the decision actually came down, hey, you need to come on home, get ready to uh, clean up the vehicle and uh, close the payload bay doors, and let's, uh, let's head it on home to the ranch. Uh, it was a surprise and a disappointment. Columbia is being flown perfectly. It's on the uh, proper approach path to KSC runway 33. Care's coming. Rattle the center line, nail that ball bar. There's 100 feet looking for 50. Nail the ball bar. A little bit to the right. Straddle the center line. Final flare, looking good. Landing gears down and long. Main gear touchdown. Drag shoot deploy. Wheels dash. The shuttle Columbia landed at the Kennedy Space Center after completing only four days of its scheduled 16-day flight. At a cost of $500 million for the mission, safety came at a high price. are constantly on guard. One of the good uh, um, heritages, I guess you would say, from the Challenger is that we are always looking over our shoulder, trying to figure out what did I miss? What, have I haven't, what, what is it that I haven't thought about yet that's going to reach up and bite me or the crew? And um, although that has an element of paranoia to it, it is healthy paranoia, I believe. And um, I think that that's uh, uh, the proper way to look at this job. 35 millimeter for a lot of the window stuff. Yeah. With Andy Thomas about to visit the most unforgiving environment of all, these last days before blast off offer an opportunity to scrutinize the condition of Mia. Some shots The Mia space station was launched in 1986 with a projected lifespan of five years. It's long since outlived that. And in 1997, just about anything that could go wrong, did go wrong. The oxygen generators triggered a fire. Then the cooling system failed. But the most threatening incident of all was when an unmanned and remotely controlled supply ship smashed into Mir. The collision crippled Mir's solar panels and caused half of its power supply to be lost. The crew were of two Russians and one American worked excellently. They reacted in a very efficient and professional mode and they done everything possible in such as, uh, circumstances to save the space station and save their uh, lives, actually. 5, 14, 15, and 16 are complete. I mean, the fact that the Mir spacecraft is continuing, in spite of some of the problems it has, is testimony to the resilience and the hardiness of those systems. So I am not concerned about uh, safety issues of flying on Mir. Mir is safe. Uh, if it uh, will not be safe, uh, there won't be a crew on board. When Andy Thomas enters the eerie world of Mir, he'll take the place of David Wolfe, who's been living in the space station for more than four months. From his orbit above Earth, Wolfe gives Thomas words of encouragement about the task that lies ahead of him. And uh, I would say after about a month, I was feeling extremely good, and after two months, I realized just how good you could feel in space. And I'm feeling better and better every day, enjoying working in space more and more. He's going to be entering a, a world of uh, cylinders. 
with a lot of uh, cables and experiments and hardware. The things that he'll be without uh, will be, you know, sunshine in the outside of, of the doors, uh, uh, wind in his face, uh, breathing of the fresh air. Bonnie Dunbar, a PhD engineer, is the payload commander on her fifth flight. She visited Mir in 1995 on the first shuttle docking, but she says no matter how often she goes into space, it's still exciting. It's always one of a certain of an instantaneous elation. You know, I'm back. <laughs> uh, it's a new world. It's a different world. It doesn't matter how tall you are. Uh, you know, I can reach any surface. Uh, I can work in any orientation. Uh, the vehicle looks different. Uh, the floor can be the ceiling, the ceiling can be the floor. And then it's time to start a very concentrated grand adventure. <laughs> As the Endeavour crew arrives at the Kennedy Space Center from Houston in their T-38 jets, their year of training for this one flight is over. It's going to be a lot of excitement and anticipation because now you're going to have to really perform. You're going to have to, to uh, do the job that you've trained so hard to do. There's no turning back now, and for me, that's what I've worked for for all these years, and so I just cannot wait until that exact moment when those uh, solid rocket motors ignite. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would actually go and rendezvous, dock, and fly around with an orbiting space station. What a privilege. It's not only special for me to be involved with it, but it's just a special age to live in. You know, there's never been a century like this in, a, in recorded history. As I go into the flight, I'm becoming more and more aware of the fact that I'm going to be gone for a long time. I won't be able to just go for a run outside and do the things that I do here, that I'll have to accept um, the lifestyle with two colleagues uh, for an extended period of time. There's no doubt about it, it's going to be a big challenge. Now the crew goes into quarantine. This is one of the last chances the astronauts and their families will have together. My wife has been the foundation of this whole thing. You know, she's been very supportive. You know, I'm sure she's had times when she wished that she had married a preacher or somebody that didn't do this kind of work, but... We're nearly hollow. Yeah, which is what his name means. Hollow form. I'm not gonna say it's not hard at times. Sometimes it's very hard. Um, that's why we need the support of the other spouses. You pick up the phone and you call one of them and say, talk to me. <laughs> so I'm not frightened and I don't think the other wives are either. We know that um, they've done everything they can and um, the rest is left to God's care and we just, we go and watch and wish them well. They have the harder job. Yeah, much <laughs> harder than ours. Everyone's trapped in their own thoughts, and you wonder if everything will work just right. You'll get off the ground, then the solid rocket slide. You're thrust back in your seat like a, a kick in the pants. The solid rockets, they only last the first two minutes. And during that time, the vehicle really shakes quite a bit. The last uh, six minutes, you're just on the main engines, and uh, it's very, very smooth. No buffing, no shaking, uh, no anything. And then it's all over. You go from three G's to no G's in just one second. You are totally elated. I mean, suddenly you weigh nothing. You look out the window and there's the earth uh, right out there. It's just the most incredible blue and, uh, and white and beautiful planet you could possibly imagine. I mean, it's just it's stunning. You are elated. I know a very common thing for astronauts to say, and it's true, is that when you get up there and you look at the Earth's horizon, there's a beautiful, very skinny band of blue color, striated bands, uh, but not very thick, and you realize that's our atmosphere. That's what we depend upon to live, and understanding that uh, I fly around this globe in only 90 minutes, it can't be that big. We better take good care of it.
The shuttle Endeavour is now hurtling through space at 28,000 kilometers an hour. 33 hours after liftoff, it rendezvous with Mir. This delicate union demands almost microscopic accuracy as both spaceships maneuver carefully into alignment. Houston, we're with you, Tetris C and by Amir, we're looking in through your two overhead windows. Home sweet home. It's an impressive sight, actually. It's, it's just amazing. It's been described as a big uh, mosquito or dragonfly, and it's right. It's got all kinds of wings on it. It's an incredible sight. We will get to 30 feet from here, and we'll look at the docking target there, and we'll read that and then execute a series of maneuvers to align ourselves with the docking target, and then Terry will press on in from there to go and, uh, and dock. The docking module on Mir acts as an airlock sealing the two vehicles, allowing safe passage from one to the other. With the ships now linked together, Terry Wilcott opens the hatch, and in the dark of space, one world greets another. This is Mission Control, Houston. And greetings all around. Reminder to push and hold the bips move. This is the first human contact for the crew of Mir in 17 weeks. Although I could have lived fine a lot longer psychologically, physically, but there's a lot of fun and good business to be done on Earth. Endeavour stays Dr. Mir for five days. Several tons of science experiments, food supplies and fresh drinking water are transported from spacecraft to spacecraft. Then it's time to begin the separation procedure. For Andy Thomas, David Wolfe's return to Earth signals the beginning of his own odyssey in space. It's time to bid farewell to the crew with whom he's worked so closely for such a long time. It's sad, and uh, you have mixed feelings. Imagine uh, taking one of your friends to a, a desert island and giving him supplies, and then sailing off without him to leave him there for a few months. It's a, it's a sad thing. I assure you, everyone on the crew will have mixed feelings about closing the hatch and then leaving Andy on board here. I think uh, probably more than anything, um, it's going to be another amazing experience because actually I'm going to get to watch the shuttle pull away and photograph the shuttle flying autonomously in space. You don't often get to do that in this line of work. I think it's probably not till later on that I'm going to really appreciate that it has indeed gone and that I'm there for the duration of the mission. Each astronaut's stay on Mir comes at a price. NASA has no space station of its own, so since 1995, for the astronauts combined 962 days on Mir, the United States paid Russia $400 million. As a mission specialist aboard Mir, Andy Thomas spends most of his time running diverse scientific experiments, from the cosmic ray detector to plant growth studies and the impact of zero gravity on the body. Oh, both, both good. Perhaps the, the one that's taking most of my time, and certainly the one I find most sort of captivating from an interest point of view, is uh, the growth of cellular tissue in a uh, bioreactor vessel. And this is an attempt to grow uh, 
as human cancer cells in an artificial environment, uh, the idea that you could synthesize um, an artificial tumor which you could use for uh, biomedical studies, so far indications are that it's, it's, it's going quite well and we're quite pleased. For the first three weeks of the mission, Thomas shared his research space with five other cosmonauts. This was the changeover period, providing time to adjust to the strange realities of weightlessness. You get used to the idea that you can have things like this in front of you and uh, that that's normal, that's the norm. Um, and, and, you know, if you think about it, that's a really a bizarre concept. You know, after 40-something years of living on the planet, I've not been able to do this, now I can do this. While this zero gravity can be an exciting challenge, back on Earth, it can prove difficult to reaccustom to, as David Wolfe found. <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting, we had some testing to do. Oh, okay. Hold on here. I'll do that. It's all right. It's tough. I won't kid you. I feel fine, but you'll notice I'm keeping my head pretty still because if I turn my head very much, my body feels like it's accelerating into the next room and the room will turn upside down, so I'm being very careful. But uh, I feel about as I expected. It's, it's hard to live in space and it's hard to come back, and that's a lot of what our research is all about. Back in zero G, Thomas's crewmates have been spacewalking to repair the damaged vehicle. And the, uh, I had uh, uh, the armchair view of it all. I was looking out the windows, and it was really fascinating to watch uh, my two colleagues uh, moving around outside in the pressure suits and handling the equipment and uh, uh, doing the work out there. While the astronauts stay busy and mentally occupied, there are certain small things that can cause dissatisfaction. Well, let's see. All of us are missing uh, tea and coffee with sugar. We, we, we all have a sweet tooth, and we've, we've bought a lot of uh, tea and coffee, but it's without sugar. <laughs> Every morning we complain that we have no sugar in our tea and coffee. When I made the menu up for my food, I thought, well, I'll be healthy for a few months, but in hindsight, I wish I'd perhaps not been quite so healthy <laughs> and, and bought some coffee with uh, tea with sugar. Um, that's probably about all in, in terms of uh, food that I'm missing. Uh, a hot shower would be very nice right about now, I'd have to admit. But there are more fundamental issues that Thomas grapples with on Mir. This is as isolated as any human being can become from Earth. And the effects of that are beginning to tell. It's a funny kind of isolation, actually, because you're actually not that far from Earth. When you look out the window, you can see it. Uh, you can see clouds, and you can see landforms. It's a fascinating view, of course. Um, but you still feel a great sense of distance, even though it may not look that far. Particularly if you uh, might be flying over uh, your home city and you look down and see it and you think, uh, you know, it looks quite close and you think, uh, just down there is my house and all my friends and so on, I could, I could just get there for a while. And of course, you might be close to it in distance, but uh, you're enormously apart from it in speed because we're traveling at such a high speed, 17,500 miles an hour. So the view is gone and you pass your home uh, in no time, but you do feel pangs at those times when you see it. Andy Thomas's experiences on Mir, his thoughts and feelings, as well as the changes to his body, are being catalogued by NASA as it prepares for an even bolder space venture, the International Space Station. There's a lot of information we learned from this mission, and of course Andy, who's up there now, will learn a lot, and it's our job to transfer that information uh, into the International Space Station program. The program is the biggest multinational building project in history. Sixteen nations working together to construct a permanently occupied laboratory in space. I think it was inevitable that uh, a collaboration in the space program would cross international boundaries. And I think that's the way it should be because uh, no one country um, should own space. It's, uh, it, it, it is 
uh, universes, the, the territory of the universe, and is not up for ownership. The International Space Station will be so big, the length of one and a half football fields, that it'll be visible with the naked eye from Earth. It's the future of space, and it's exactly where I want to be. The International Space Station will be constructed bit by bit in 43 supply flights. Each country's contribution will be ferried up to the orbiting facility and attached. It was originally scheduled to be completed in the year 2002. Now, the estimated completion date is 2004 or as late as 2006. And the cost? In total, uh, it uh, might cost about $20 billion. That's a uh, certainly estimated uh, cost. Hopefully, we will not exceed it. Really, it isn't that expensive uh, when you finally look at it. Um, in terms of the individual American, you know, we're looking at about a dollar out of their tax bill. If you look at the history of mankind, mankind's always had a desire to make an investment to expand his boundaries. That's been true from the days of Columbus, and I don't see space as being any different from any of those other endeavors that we've seen through the history of mankind. The International Space Station heralds the new dawn of space exploration and discovery. For Andy Thomas, it could well be the next chapter in his extraordinary journey as an astronaut. There's a great sense of um, freedom that you have because you say, well, I've done that. Even if I never do it again, I have done it, I have experienced it, uh, and it was a good experience, and it was everything that I wanted it to be, and more. And uh, that, that gives you a lot of peace and a lot of contentment, and with peace and contentment comes freedom. Main gear touchdown. With John Glenn successfully launched on America's 123rd manned mission into space, we recall the moment he became the first American to orbit Earth. Godspeed, John Glenn, next.